more of them, until a very much later date, hundreds of years later, when we find the rising of Christian mysticism in Europe. But probably a thousand years passed, and the great institutions of Elysis and Samothrace, the ritualistic temples of Memphis and Luxor, Karnak, the great temples of Egypt, particularly Memphis of the White Walls, all these disappeared. We find, for example, that with the rise of Christian mysticism in Syria, the Essenes disappeared, and no one has the slightest knowledge of what happened to them. <coughs> they vanished. The moment the breakthrough took place, the old schools that had been the custodians of the lore and had only accepted candidates under oath and obligation, the schools vanished. The uh, one possible solution to this is that once the arcana, or the secret of the schools, the knowledge which they had so long religiously guarded, became public, their own existence ceased. Because you cannot maintain a secret that is out, nor can you initiate people to gain a special knowledge which they can gain without it. Uh, this, the levels that these schools represented then moved into society to become an objective, recognized system. In, <coughs> in the hundreds of years that followed, we have the building upon these foundations because this revelation of laws was a pretty tremendous thing. And it brought out foundations that could not be immediately uh, exhausted nor fully built upon. It has taken centuries to build upon these foundations even as far as we have today. And without the knowledge of the Greeks and Egyptians of 2,500 years ago, modern man would never have advanced his knowledge of electronic or atomic energy. Because he is actually making his calculations with the instruments that were given to him by the Greeks, Egyptians, and Arabs. Thus, from the emerging of these things, we begin to see why out of the ruin of a theology which had failed due to the wars that had destroyed men's faith in the ancient gods, there arose a new object or a new instrument of faith, faith in wisdom, faith in essential value. And this wisdom gradually became synonymous with God. Deity was no longer the Olympian despot. Deity was now the extraordinarily wise father, the old learned one. Deity was moving gradually into the relationship of the mentor, of the great teacher. And in the uh, speculations upon this subject, it was not difficult to imagine that this universal mind, this power that was behind the whole great institution of learning should suddenly blaze forth as the most convincing concept of deity that there was. So God became no longer a symbol of power, but a symbol of wisdom. This was something that actually the Greeks did not have. The Greeks had deity as an object of veneration. And in the Mithraic hymns, uh, not Mithraic, the Orphic hymns, we find a great adoration for deity. But the Olympian gods were a rather frivolous lot as a whole. Uh, they had some other strange and inconsistent practices and were not entirely admirable, as even Socrates pointed out. There were some scandals among the immortals that were better not mentioned even by the Greeks. <laughs> Some of these scandals, rather well whitewashed, have descended to us in Bullfinch's mythology of the Greeks and Romans. Whatever scandals, however, were whitewashed by the Greeks were revealed in their full splendor by the Romans. And it was not uh, the state religion. It was the great school of philosophers rebelling against it. Not rebelling against the gods, but rebelling against the literal acceptance of, of doctrines which they held to have mystical or secret meaning that made possible the rise of Pythagoras and Plato. Because it was the duty of these men 
to refine and improve and deepen and broaden the concept of religion. That men should realize that these fables were actually stories of secrets and wonders that could only be fully understood by those who had been initiated into the sacred colleges and rites. And that then in these schools the keys were given by means of which these fables were unlocked in all their internal splendor. A man could begin to appreciate the greatness of the things which he had once regarded as frivolous. This, re this remedying of an obvious defect resulting from man outgrowing his own infancy, uh, the uh, great philosophers uh, strenuously attempted to achieve, and they did to a great degree. Gradually the world caught up with them, and these philosophical systems that were once for the few became increasingly significant to the many. Now this tremendous rise of intellectual rebellion against limitation brought also with it a certain inevitable reaction. You know, we find, for instance, a very interesting thing that as soon as the public mind began to be highly philosophy conscious, the philosophers gradually became mystics. The leaders departed from this pattern also and began to emphasize a purely theistic, intuitive approach to deity. It seemed as though they instinctively realized that intellectualism would run the whole thing into the ground, finally. That men substituting mind for God were going to fall out of the horns of another dilemma. They were going to gradually grow great with pride. They were going to worship their own thoughts. And they were going to adore the products of their own mind. And they were going to lose the basic intuitive power which comes only from humility. Thus, even at the beginning, you see the struggle taking form that was finally to emerge. The philosophizing and the revelation of certain great secrets from the temples could no longer be stopped. The breaking down of the mystery institutions, the final dispersing of the priesthoods, the conquering of the areas, the, the pillaging of the great sanctuaries, scattering their teachers meant only the inevitable need for the preservation of ideas. And the only way to preserve them was to throw them into the very public mind from which they had once been protected. Because only then could the common man be the keeper of the mystery. Otherwise it would have died with that generation. But no sooner had this occurred than it became obvious that a great danger was also presenting itself. And this probably was the one great surviving, preserving factor that threw a number of these early important leaders into the Christian camp. Here was an important control or directive against the rising of the wisdom principle to the point of mental arrogance. Here was humility. Here was a simple doctrine of human relationships. Here was a simple teaching of the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God and do good. Serve, love, have faith, and practice the virtues. This coming into conflict with the revelation of exact knowledge seemingly occurs in pattern in the mingling of the wisdom of the old mystery systems with the emotional, mystical content which was so present in human nature. And these mingling produced the heresies. They produced the conflicts which mutilated the first six centuries of the Christian era. Here then we had the beginning of the schismatic difficulties. We had the wisdom principle and the love or emotion principle drawing apart, trying to build a bridge, each attempting to absorb the other, each determined to preserve itself against absorption. 
and finally in many instances parting as foes and each going its own way deprived of the most valuable of all factors that which would have been reconciliation the bringing of these things together so that we could have had an enlightened love and we could have had a truly spiritualized human idealized wisdom the dividing of these two groups has never been completely overcome but the mind being by nature a dominant and inquisitive instrument has continued to dominate and has continued to lead man into intellectual intellectual segregation ever since that time until today mind dominates practically every attitude and action of the human being. Our emetic problem then seems to deal with the breakthrough in North Africa of certain secret instructions. We know that the priests of Amun-Ra, those who wrote the rituals of the dead, those who gave the ancient Egyptian Ammonism, and later the Osirian religious cult those who swung their censers before the altars of the great old gods these priests with their chants their rituals their rites and their ceremonies were not the builders of the pyramid the builders of the pyramid were mathematicians masters of geometry deeply versed in astronomy possessors of exact sciences these exact sciences therefore moved behind the surface of Egyptian religion and Dr. Preston pointed out that he was he told me one day that he was uh, convinced that the Egyptian hieroglyphics have at least two different methods of being read one being a sacerdotal language a language of priestly process and the other in some way related to the mystery systems. Dr. Preston was convinced that behind the surface of Egyptian religion was this great wisdom cult, the cult that produced Imhotep, the father of medicine, the cult which made possible the building of these great monuments, and also the gradual regulation of the laws of Egypt until Egypt became probably one of the most magnificently integrated cultures in the history of antiquity. These things were practical achievements, achievements that could only have arisen from adequate knowledge. The people did not possess that knowledge. The Egyptian lived and died without it. Uh, the, uh, ruler, the rulers of Egypt, although initiated into the priesthood, did not always possess it. Actually, it was held by a group an organization, a secret body of persons. And this secret body perpetuated itself by rites and ceremonies, as described by Plutarch in his Mysteries of Isis and Osiris. This breaking through in Egypt seems to have given us the basic principles of Hermetic philosophy, because these principles deal with certain things, the true nature of deity. The true nature of deity here interpreted as the eternal mind which brings all things into existence by the power of thought. Thus Thoth, Thought, Hermes, Mercury gives us the concept of a world that exists in the divine mind. A projection and manifestation of the eternal thinker. And he tells us that the world is the non-eternal thought of that eternal thinker that all things are supported on the warp and woof of thought, thought, thoth. For our word thought comes from his name. This being, therefore, which is the creating power, creates by will, creates by the exercise of secret attributes. This deity is not a highly glorified Louis the Sixteenth. This deity is not the Zeus of ancient 
Greece, nor the Jupiter of the Latins. This is a mystery God, a God without form, of which all things are the form, a God without dimensions or proportions, but containing all dimensions and proportions within its own nature, a God of seven powers, which are seven arts and sciences, and a God ruling by the inevitable motion of its own being, 